Good afternoon, and welcome to our celebration of Holy Mass. Our gathering hymn is number 38, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Again, that's number 38. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. Son of Mary, 
God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Let us pray. O God, who see how your people faithfully await the feast of the Lord's Nativity, enable us, we pray, to attain the joys of so great a salvation and to celebrate them always with solemn worship and glad rejoicing. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners to announce a year of favor from the Lord and a day of vindication by our God. I rejoice heartily in the Lord. In my God is the joy of my soul, for he has clothed me with a robe of salvation and wrapped me in a mantle of justice. Like a bridegroom adorned with a diadem, like a bride bedecked with her jewels. As the earth brings forth its plants, and a garden makes its growth spring up, so will the Lord God make justice and praise spring up before all the nations. The word of the Lord. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Brothers and sisters, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In all circumstances give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances. Test everything, retain what is good. Refrain from every kind of evil. May the God of peace make you perfectly holy, and may you entirely, spirit, soul, and body, 
be preserved blameless for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will also accomplish it. The word of the Lord. from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to the Lord. A man named John was sent from God. He came for testimony, to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to testify to the light. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to him to ask him, who are you? He admitted and did not deny it, but admitted, I am not the Christ. So they asked him, what are you then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? So that we can give an answer to those who send us. What do you have to say for yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the desert, make straight the way of the Lord. As Isaiah the prophet said, some Pharisees were also sent. They asked him, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ or Elijah or the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but there is one among you whom you do not recognize the one who is coming after me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. This happened in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. So how do you ask that question? Where do you put your emphasis? Who are you? Is it who are you? Or who are you? That question is the most telling question because what it is intended to do is probed to the very center of John the Baptist's identity, his self-knowledge, his self-understanding. It is a very personal question. It is a very probing question. It is not the sort of question that you ask people. Who are you? It is not a where question. It is not a question about what do you do, who are your parents, where were you born, what group are you associated with? This question, when it is asked, is a statement, and that is a directive. Define yourself. 
Who are you? A person can only properly respond to that question if he or she clearly understands and is aware of one's own motivations, one's own desires, what inspires, what guides, what directs one's words and actions. Who are you? Define yourself. What would you respond? It is a very difficult question to, un to answer unless one really does understand what makes you tick, so to speak. And John understands, first of all, whom he is not. And that is always a place to begin. He knows he is not the Messiah. He knows he is not Elijah in the sense that Elijah that lived some 800 years prior to him, or 850 years, really. He is not the prophet. Nobody's quite sure what they meant by that, but he knows I'm not that. Whatever you think that is, I'm not him. But he does understand who he is because he knows he has a commission, and that commission is given to him by God. He is a voice, a voice that calls everyone who will listen to the words he is speaking to understand that those words are not John's words. John is a voice that speaks God's words so that those persons who hear and heed the word that they listen and receive will move toward a path or a course of life that is filled with light. And so he testifies to the light. And what we know is that some hear and listen and respond, and others hear and ignore. Today, we meet the ones who do not respond, but rather question and ignore. They ignore John's voice, and they ignore, more importantly, the word that God is speaking through John's voice. And why is that? I want to give a few thoughts about how a person, perhaps more in the contemporary environment today, in our world, might not listen and might reject. And there's a series of them. That person might say to him or herself, if I agree to what you are saying, then I must give up or at least stop doing the things that I desire to do. Or if I agree and listen to what you are saying and follow your words, John, then my belief system is undone. It unravels. And then who am I that my belief system is gone? Or another, if I agree, John, to what you are saying, then I am not the center of my own decisions. I am not the one who makes all the choices, but I must rather submit to God's guidance and to God's direction. Or perhaps another would say, if I agree with your words, John, then there is something greater than me that I must obey. Or if I agree, then fulfilling what pleases me is no longer the highest and greatest value in my life. What then will replace fulfilling what pleases me? To this one, John the Baptist's task is like describing the Mona Lisa to a person who is born blind. You simply cannot, with words, 
to a person born blind describe so beautiful a painting, the texture, the color, the composition, the way that the artist drew and painted and filled in the beauty of that great masterpiece, it simply can't be done because that person cannot see. That person, spiritually speaking, is blind. But let us remember that nothing is impossible with God. How then does one penetrate spiritual blindness? First, we must always remember that even John the Baptist's voice did not convince everyone. Neither his words that he spoke, which were God's words, neither his appearance nor the manner of his life or, the, or even all of those people who were being baptized, whose lives were changing, who were seeing and hearing what John had to say, none of that seemed to make a difference for some people. And we know by reading the Gospels that even Jesus, his sublime speech, his wisdom, the miracles, the great compassion, his presence, which was awe-inspiring, for some, it couldn't break through that spiritual blindness to move a hardened heart. You see, there is a great mystery here with respect to how divine grace works in people's lives and how and why in some circumstances it illumines the mind and motivates the will to take action and to change, and yet in another person, it has not that ability or not that response. When a person labors for a purposeful reward, what we know is that one will endure much to obtain the goal. If your heart is set on the thing you want to acquire or achieve, nothing will stop you from obtaining that goal that is reasonable at least. However, when a person sees only before him or before herself futility and emptiness, who judges life as having no purpose, as judges life as having no reward outside of immediate pleasure, that one is convinced that life ends in nothingness. How does a person of faith instill hope in that skeptic mind? How does one communicate the prospect of eternal happiness to the one who simply will not believe? It is the great and perhaps final challenge of this age and every age. I want to turn for a moment to respond to that question I've asked and draw your attention to something I read just a few days ago, and it came out in the Knights of Columbus magazine. Ma Knights of Columbus, if you're not aware, actually I have to assume that some people aren't aware of a lot of these things, so forgive me if I am redundant, but Knights of Columbus are, whether they, they have access, if you want to know after the mass, go back and talk to them. They have some things they want to show you. And they'll tell you who, who the Knights of Columbus are. But every month, the Knights of Columbus has a magazine that comes out, a little periodical called Columbia. And the one in December came out, and I noticed there was an article that I found, I found uh, very telling and very inspiring, for me at least. And it was a story of two uh, young men. They, they just graduated last May from Georgia Tech. And four years earlier, when they went to Georgia Tech, as freshmen, they met, they met each other and they immediately despised one another. <laughs> they did not hit it off. Uh, one of them was quite a good, apparently quite well, uh, he actually got a scholarship, I think, or at least he was there, Georgia Tech, on their football team. And he is a place kicker. And he was, his name is Harrison. And Harrison was, is extremely good at, at, his, at, his, at, this, at this task of place kicking. If you're not familiar with football, that's the guy who kicks the ball on the, um, uh, on the kickoff, <laughs> as they call it. And then someone puts it on the ground and they kick. The other fellow, his name was Grant, and he was a punter. The punter is someone who usually kicks the ball at the fourth down or something like that. We don't want to go into football, but anyway. <laughs> I just to think it, I mean, I, I mean, there are people who don't know what I'm talking about, so I'm sorry about that. I can't help you out. Anyway. 
These two individuals met each other and immediately despised one another. So the second year, um, uh, um, I have to get him straight, Grant, the punter, the guy who punts, he finally gets on the football team, and uh, he is what they call a walk-on. So he gets on the team, and it turns out that Harrison, who is, who is just an extremely talented uh, young man, he, in their second year, he, he finds in his own personal life that he's terribly frustrated, he is lonely, and he had been, he had grew up a Catholic, but he hadn't been in church, you know, all of his life pretty much. And he really had no use for what he considered the church's oppressive rules and regulations. He had, he had wanted nothing to do with any of that. And yet his life was, was really empty, even though he was extremely good at what he was doing. And he looked over at Grant, who he, I mean, who, uh, at Grant, the, the punter, whom he really doesn't like and has disliked him from the first day he met him. And what he sees is a joyful man who happens to be a Catholic. And so he asks himself this question. He says, how can someone live the way the church wants and still be joyful? Seems contradiction. And so what happens is Harrison begins to ask questions of Grant. And Grant begins to reply to and responds to his questions. And if those questions are ones that he can't answer because he has his own story, which I won't go into, that has caused him or made him into a man of faith, he then directs Harrison to the one who knows, which is a wonderful principle. If you don't know the answer, seek out the one who does and then take yourself or that other person to him or her. And that's what he did. And all of this is the manifestation of how God's grace works in people's lives. The next thing that happens is Grant begins to invite or invited Harrison to go to Mass. They have a daily Mass there and on campus. And they began to attend together. And Harrison experienced the joy of faith. In his own words, he said, I would still be miserable right now if it weren't for that aggravating guy who became one of my best friends. If you watch football, Harrison is a place kicker for the Kansas City Chiefs now. Apparently he did quite well his first season. And Grant is in seminary. And both of them are Knights of Columbus, both of them are active Catholics, and both of them are the closest of friends. What do we learn? I think we learn that we should never underestimate the power of God's light to break through a person's spiritual blindness. There are people, I believe, at this mass, don't stand up and do this, but there are people at this mass who I believe there are some who could testify to how God broke into their, his or her life and manifested something that this person was completely blind to before. I know that's true. I'm certain of it. And the second thing we learn is that we should always make our outward appearance and our actions, our voice, our words reflect the inward convictions of our faith and our hope so that we as a human being are like a clear window that's washed, so to speak, and that another person can look into our soul and see there a person of faith. because people do observe us. Let us never forget that. It is so easy to forget that. Your example and the actions of the Holy Spirit on another person as God chooses, and in the manner in which God chooses, and in the time in which God chooses, and I will suggest along with the intercessions of the Blessed Virgin Mary, let us never forget her that those will work together to bring the light of God's grace on another person and to penetrate any and all spiritual darkness and blindness. So that one's manner of living day to day 
is the way that you and I answer the question that was posed to John, who are you? Who are you? It was Harrison who asked Grant that question, not in so many words, but he wanted to know what makes you tick? Why are you so joyful? I don't get it. Who are you? May our reply be that I am a person of faith who believes completely in the promises of God. And that is why I live the manner of life that I live. For it is God's grace and God's light that has given me that knowledge and that hope. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, but substantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess from baptism and the forgiveness of sins, that I look forward to the resurrection of the dead, the life of the world to come. Let us bring our prayers to Almighty God for the church, for the world, and for all people. For the church, may we bring hope to the world by the authentic embrace of the gospel and the witness we seek to give in daily choices, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who live in fear, darkness, and hopelessness, May they come to see in the gift of Christmas the truth that God dwells among us, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the protection of all police officers, firemen, and those in military service as they seek to serve the common good, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those the Lord is inviting to vocations in the church, may they not hesitate to rejoice in hope and explore the call. For all in discernment among us, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the needs in our hearts and for the repose of the souls of all the faithful departed, especially Father Albion Bulger, for whom this Mass is offered, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, in your kindness, hear the prayers that we have brought to you in faith. Inspire in our hearts those words and actions that will always give honor and glory to you. And by means of these prayers that are fulfilled according to your will, grant that we may continue to be persons of faith who inspire those to whom we meet. All of which we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join together in singing number 63, Ready the Way. That's number 63. Thank <laughs> you. 
Brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice May the sacrifice of our worship, Lord, we pray, be offered to you unceasingly to complete what was begun in sacred mystery and powerfully accomplish for us your saving work through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For all the oracles <coughs> of the prophets foretold him. The Virgin Mother longed for him with love beyond all telling. John the Baptist sang of his coming and proclaimed his presence when he came. It is by his gift that already we rejoice at the mystery of his nativity, so that he may find us watchful in prayer and exultant in his praise. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. You therefore, Almighty Father, we bless through Jesus Christ, your Son, who comes in your name. He himself is the word that brings salvation, the hand you extend to sinners, the way by which your peace is offered to us. When we ourselves had turned away from you on account of our sins, you brought us back to be reconciled, O Lord, so that converted at last to you, we might love one another through your Son, whom for our sake you handed over to Seth, and now celebrating the reconciliation Christ has brought us. We entreat you sanctify these gifts for the outpouring of your spirit, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, whose command we fulfill when we celebrate these mysteries. But when about to give his life to set us free as he reclined at supper, he himself took bread into his hands and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples saying, take this all of you and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, on the same evening, he took the chalice of blessing in his hands, confessing your mercy, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, 
Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Celebrating, therefore, the memorial of the death and resurrection of your Son, who left us this pledge of his love, we offer you what you have bestowed on us, the sacrifice of perfect reconciliation. Holy Father, we humbly beseech you to accept us also together with your Son, and in this saving banquet, graciously to endow us with his very Spirit, who takes away everything that estranges us from one another. May he make your church a sign of unity and an instrument of your peace among all people, May he keep us in communion with Francis, our Pope, and Peter, our Bishop, and all the bishops and your entire people. Just as you have gathered us now at the table of your Son, so also bring us together with the glorious Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and all the saints, with our brothers and sisters and those of every race and tongue who have died in your friendship, bring us to share with them the unending banquet of unity in a new heaven and a new earth, where the fullness of your peace will shine forth in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, our glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you, look not on our sins but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Thank you. 
on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter into my room. Let every heart 
Please join together in singing number 45, that's 4-5, The King Shall Come When Morning Dawns. Let us pray. We implore your mercy, Lord, that this divine sustenance may cleanse us of our faults and prepare us for the coming feasts. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Bow down for the blessing. May the almighty and merciful God, by whose grace you have placed your faith in the first coming of his only begotten Son, and yearn for his coming again, sanctify you by the radiance of Christ's advent and enrich you with his blessing. Amen. As you run the race of this present life, may he make you firm in faith, joyful in hope, and active in charity. Amen. Amen. So that rejoicing now with devotion at the Redeemer's coming in the flesh, you may be endowed with the rich reward of eternal life when he comes again in majesty. Amen. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. Please join together in singing number 50, O Come Divine Messiah. That's number 50. Shall 
Christmas.